Okay, we're jumping into the sermon a bit early today because just as me and um, Tiara were talking and praying and thinking, we just wanted to spend some time singing and giving God some space and time to talk to us rather than you just have to listen to me. Yeah, I'm sure God will talk through me, but I also want to give us space and time for the Holy Spirit to do some work in that as well. So we're going we're to sing a bit after the sermon as well. But the next few weeks, I want to talk about this idea of home. We all know what that means, don't we? When I say the word home, does a, does a feeling come over you when you think about that? I think it does. I think it, it brings a certain positive, safe feelings that we sometimes get in a place. Who thinks of a place when they think home? Put your hand up. No? Yeah? Pete, what do you think of when you think place? Uh, Gola. Gola. That is great. Anyone further afield feel home? Anyone think of a place? Heart. Rob says heart. I like that too. Oh, my clicker's doing weird things. It's not working, Paul. Um, I wanted to read the next slide <laughs> to get the words exactly right. And I've got a video for you that I wanted to show that makes me think of, think of home too. Let's have a look. Hey, there we go. So there's something about being home where everything feels just right. We are surrounded by people we love and trust and there's a feeling of stability and safety. This feeling... Julian Norwich wrote these words, as it should be. That the idea that this world of home should be as it should be. There's a sense we know it should be like this and we get that feeling quite often when we're home. So when we're away from those feelings, we're desperate sometimes to come home. When I think of that, when we think of people coming home and seeing that emotion, I think of... I'm sure you've seen some of these videos, but servicemen coming home to their family, people missing people who have been in danger and are coming home unexpectedly. So I want to show you a little bit of a video. Love this. <laughs> Try not to cry. But it doesn't look like there's something about that, doesn't there, when we recognise what, as it should be. When we have that feeling that we live our lives so often in the space and places where life isn't quite as it should be. So when we get those moments where it feels like this is right, we have those moments, it's overwhelming to us. I know even just sitting there, I've watched that a bunch of times, and it just, it's just overwhelming because it's that moment where you're realising the emotion of something that's fully realised. This is actually the metaphor that the Bible uses to talk about what heaven is like, what it is like to be with him forever, is this idea of home. In fact, it talks about quite often the picture of a homecoming, yeah? a feast where everybody's welcome and that we get to celebrate Numbers of times Jesus told stories like this for us to understand what it's like for things to be as it should be, this idea of heaven. He told the story, Luke 14, of this feast that a master puts on and he invites people and people don't want to go. So he just opens the door to say, anybody come along to celebrate this. Matthew 21, Luke 15, same story. We know this story at the end of the prodigal son story. Yeah? The prodigal son story is a son that was lost, that is now found. Yeah? That overwhelming need to celebrate, to have a feast, and all are welcome. 
and all are welcome. This picture of the kingdom is one of generosity and one of welcome. These are the heart of who God is. The heart of who God is and that God wants the whole world to know he is a generous God. He is an embracing God. He has made us to be with him, communion with him. And that welcome is extended to anyone who would walk in. To anyone who would choose to come in and be with him and sit with him. But we know that is not the condition that we live in. That tension of when we, or said when we have those moments where we feel it, it's overwhelming. Because to be honest, most of the time we sense this feeling. The Bible talks about this idea of exile. That we aren't in the place where our real home is. The Israelites lived in that place quite often, actually. Way more often than they actually lived where they felt like they had Israel as home. Most of the time they lived in this condition of exile, of that understanding our home is not quite realised. We can either live in that sort of condition, and the other idea the Bible talks about of where our condition is, is we live in scarcity. What do I mean by that? We live as if we don't think that we have enough. And both of these two things, if we're not careful, will actually lead us to a path of destruction or a path that is unhelpful. Scarcity and exile can make us take matters into our own hands. And this is the heart of what sin is. So often we think of sin as in good and bad or evil and good. But this picture, actually, the picture of when we look at first sin, the Bible actually tells the story, it's actually when Adam and Eve took it into their own hands, said that we can be God's. We can decide what's good and evil. We can decide. It isn't the fact of doing good and evil. It's actually deciding what we think is better for us because ultimately, Jesus talked about this idea. It claimed our scarcity. is isn't a problem caused by a lack of resources, but rather taking matters into our own hands actually looks like the fact that we cannot trust God. Does that make sense? Why do we do that? Scarcity in exile says, well, actually, I know that we're meant to have enough. I know that I'm meant to have a home. We know that deep inside, and so we go, that's it. It's not working out quite the way we, sh- we think it should. So I'll take it into my own hands. And there is the story of all that's wrong with humanity. It's not that we can't do it, it's because we can do it in a way that brings destruction. Because we can't do it with love and compassion and mercy. We often hurt ourselves and hurt others. That our taking selfish nature will always end in that place. When we're actually made to trust him, Because we have a home where? In him. I want to read, we know this probably story from Luke 15, the prodigal son story. And it starts, the chapter starts, and the whole chapter is something God's talking to. Now tax collectors and sinners were gathering around to hear Jesus. Jesus, because he was the generosity and the welcome of God incarnate, he is God, people were immediately drawn to that. It didn't matter what part or thing, that they were, who they were. Tax collectors and sinners mean something, meant anybody. Yeah? No matter what they thought, what they did. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes 
sinners and eats with them. Pharisees and teachers of the law, I guess, are those people that thought they'd had God figured out and lived in this way of God. Why, why is Jesus, if he represents God or he thinks he's doing the right thing, why would he include all those people that are far away, doing the wrong thing. We know they are. How can he welcome them? I'm going to come back to that word welcome because I think it's really important. And it's not actually a great translation in the Greek. So we would just see welcome because it means a lot more than that. Jesus then told these three stories. When he understood that people were going, weren't getting where he was coming from told three stories. The lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son, which is the prodigal son story. And all three stories, we know these stories, don't we? Ish. It's about this idea, the lost sheep. What's the story of the lost sheep? Anyone? Yeah, that's right. The shepherd leaves the 99 behind and goes after the one. Seems... If, again, we know this story, so it makes sense to us. But if you were agricultural and heard this story, again, the words that are used in this place, that he leaves the 99 to be in danger. That's actually the words. It's almost like there is someone about to kill those 99 and he goes off for the one. Agriculturally, that would not make sense. Yep, but we've heard this story so often that we don't realise it doesn't make sense. That was the point of the story, was the point of the story was actually that God cares so much about those that are lost, that they need to know home. Lost coin, the other idea that someone would go searching and searching. And then we come to the prodigal son story, which I'm sure we've all heard, this story about a son that leaves. And and the story really is about the way that the father acts, because the way the father acts to embrace his son that went away and not not followed him, didn't want to be a part of the family anymore, and the way he embraced him when he came back, it's embarrassing. In that culture, it was completely and utterly embarrassing of the way that a patriarch acted. To the point the people in the story would have heard would have been feeling and thinking terrible things about the father of the way that he would have acted to show his disgrace to want the son back. And then there's, a, there's the older son that wouldn't even come to the party. Wouldn't even come to the party. And missed out. The father said to his servants, remember we're talking about this, story, this picture of home and the feast? Again, it comes to this But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Bring a ring on his finger and the sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. You, we're going to do that for Passover. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again, was lost and is found. So let's celebrate. The heart of who God is, the heart of what home is, is that we celebrate when people come to be a part of things. We celebrate that they are welcome. They are welcome. Fostokomai is a word, a Greek word. Yep, it's not usually the word they use for for welcome, because this word, the dokomai, does mean welcome. But with that, it actually talks about. It's actually meant to mean embrace. Yep unabashed embrace. That was the word that was meant to go back. If you remember back when I said welcome sinners, that the church people, the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, the people who thought they knew God, had a problem with Jesus unabashedly embracing, loving to the point of embarrassment. That is the welcome of God. Jesus showed us the welcome of God was for anybody. 
his home is not a place, but it's him. He is our home. God will want us to know that little bit of the feeling that you get at a, at a house that you might have had for ages, or for us, a new place, or a place where you feel like you belong, or you get safety. That is just a small taste of this embrace of the welcome of God that he wants us to know and experience. And maybe you had that little bit of a feeling of overwhelmness from that that video. It's just a taste of what it's going to be like when we celebrate at the feast that God calls us into. We're going to have that for Passover, just before Easter, on the Wednesday night, Cafe Nova. That's the point of that feast. The point, Israelites celebrated six feasts a year to celebrate what God had done. Not what they did, but what God had done for them. Because they remind again, come together and celebrate. Come together and celebrate. Because our home is not a place. It is him. And he calls us to do the same. He calls us to be people who live in the same way. That we would embrace anybody. You thought I was going to say something after that? No, just anybody. Because every person has a divine spark in them. Every person is loved and accepted by our Creator. That welcome of God is what He's called us to. And now I talked about this last year, one of the things I felt we were called to. Because coming together like this on a Sunday, we can be realise some parts of what church is meant to be. Yep, Where we get to celebrate God. We get to worship him and know our place. We get to hear from him. And we get to do that in community. All great things that we can do of what it is to be church. To be God's welcome to people. But it's not everything that church can be. You know what? We're missing sometimes bits and pieces on a Sunday of what church is fully meant to be. We're fully meant to be family. Yeah. We're fully meant to be sharing our burdens with one another and praying for one another. We're fully meant to be close enough that we can be a little bit vulnerable with what's really going on. That's hard to do in a, in, a, in a bigger room, isn't it? We know that. Some weird people like me don't have a problem with that. I'll share any, any, any stupid vulnerability. Yeah, But for most normal people, we have to know the people to be able to trust them a bit. And I think that happens in smaller groups. And so I'm, I'm encouraging you, if you're wanting to be the welcome of God, I'm wanting us to do that and look for places and spaces we can do that. There's a few life groups that happen. I know for yeah, young adults, uh, one happened, we're about to start another one. But I'm also letting you know, Ali and Chappie, when they come back, they want to start something called Open Houses. Me and Angela start that at our house as well the coming weeks and we'll give a date to that. But we're wondering if there's other people that might want to open their home too. doesn't matter how often, we're going to be weekly and essentially that's going to look like a shared meal. Whoever wants to come, bring some food, we're going to eat together. Is there nothing better than eating together? Yeah. As far as I know, it's definitely biblical, Stephen, isn't it? Yes. I've been to these guys, their small group, and they eat, and it's good. We celebrate and share burdens. Yeah, we celebrate what's going on in people's lives, and when things aren't going, we, we, we do that together. Yeah, this Kairos Circle is basically just asking one another. I don't want it to be formal, necessarily, Bible study, but I want it to be that space of what's happening in your life, what's God doing? That's what the Kairos Circle is, and you'll, people can come and experience that, and that thing of all welcome. This isn't just the space for church. This is going to be spaces for neighbours, friends, family, people who don't know or anything to do with God. I want them to be welcome in those spaces. Yeah, because that is the welcome of God. So we're opening our house. Week's time. Whoever wants to come, come along. Come and eat with us. If we get 50, well, you'll be bringing a bit of food, so it won't matter. 
If two, that doesn't matter. Yeah, we're wanting to be, I think we are called to, in this place, in Gaula, to be the welcome of God. Can you say that amen to that? Yeah. I'm going to finish up now. We're going to sing a couple of songs to finish. We'll open. We're just going to open the space and time for you now. Whatever's been said, whatever's been said, I want you to ask, God, what are you saying to me? God, what are you doing? What are you calling me to? Yeah. We'll sing a few songs. And if you feel like you need prayer, Judy, are you able to come down the front? Judy? Yeah? Yeah, come just sit down the front. If you feel like you're wanting just someone to pray for you, I'm willing to jump off a base and do that, but Judy, I'm sure, would love to. Pray for you. We're going to sing a couple of songs. Love you to stand. Stand, let me pray. We're going to give this time to the Holy Spirit to do what the Holy Spirit wants to. Just around that idea of home. What is God calling you into? And maybe what God's asking of you to be part of his family.